so much for allowing me to have this opportunity. Um, one of the things that is the most difficult about being president is that I have yet to figure out how I can teach. And so I am working on figuring out how I'm going to get that into my schedule because I taught in every role I've had, including provost and dean, and I miss it tremendously. And um, particularly, I miss teaching public speaking. So uh, this will be this is a is a great opportunity to meet for me to have a little bit of that uh, of, of that experience. I have taught public speaking. I figured it out yesterday. This for 30 years. So I've been teaching public speaking. Um, well, I won't tell you how old I started because then you'll figure no, it out. Since I've been 21 years old, I taught my first public speaking class as a graduate student um, 30 years ago. So, and I had taught it every semester up until this last year. So this is an area that's very near and dear to my heart. So let's take a moment and talk about uh, the importance as it relates to public speaking. Gallup does a poll every single year and they ask people, what are your greatest fears? And, the, and it changes a bit from year to year. Usually in the third or fourth spot are snakes or spiders, depending, you know, they kind of go back and forth. Sometimes they're four, sometimes they're three. Clearly they don't live in a place with flying cockroaches, but spiders and snakes tend to be right there. The second greatest fear that people express is that of death. So the second thing they are most afraid of is death. And when you ask people, what are you most afraid of? Public speaking comes up first. Now, those of you who are a bit older and have watched Seinfeld over the years, he actually had a joke about this once where he said, so I guess people would rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's the case, right? People don't really feel that way. But when they think about things that they're afraid of, this pops immediately to the front of their minds. And this is really important to you as a, as a professor, as a faculty member who wants to integrate speaking opportunities into your classroom. Because it is something that comes with some weight in terms of fear. And we hope that by the time your students reach you, they have taken courses in this. But there are certain things that you can do to help build on what they learned if they took public speaking or um, introduction to communication and help build on um, what you want them to be, help them get ready to become the professionals that you want them to become. So today I'd like to share with you uh, two things really, some communication essentials upon which all great speeches are built and to help you be able to incorporate those essentials into your discussions, into your assignments, and also share some best practices to help your students develop as public speakers. So let's talk about in a very important best practice. When introducing an assignment that includes public speaking, talk about public speaking. We in communication love to communicate about our communication. It's called meta-communication. You know, never date someone in calm. It gets really like it's, it's tough. But um, it is important that, that you talk about it, that you talk about the assignment, that you talk about your expectations, that you allow them possibly to talk about their fears. So as I'm, as I'm uh, working through this uh, presentation, I'm going to give you some different tips on things that you you can or should talk about related to public speaking. But just giving the assignment and just and never discussing it in that way it is, is going to immediately get you results you don't want. They're not going to be performing at the level you want them to perform at and may actually enhance their anxiety. So here's some essentials. In the field of communication, we stress that communication is not a pipeline. And unfortunately, we see this everywhere, this attitude. I say it, you heard it, communication occurs. And that is not the case. You know, if I said to someone, can you get that to me ASAP? When do I want it? Yesterday, other people? Now, or you know, when I get around to it, right? As soon as possible. It, it can have varying timelines. The words and what we use when we communicate carry a lot of variation. And so it's really important to think about just because you say it doesn't mean someone immediately understands it. Take terms like always. Well, let's try often. How often is often? If you assigned a percentage to the word often, what would you give it? 51? Is there someone say 75? OK, what, what about sometimes? I do that sometimes. Once a week, okay. Different. What about always? Anybody? I heard some 99s and 100s. Okay. What about never? I never do that. 
10%. Okay. So when you're, if you are becoming involved in a relationship with someone and they say, I will always love you, I will never cheat on you, you want to define those always. The 10 percenter over here, you might be a little worried about. But again, it depends really on the context because the context and people's filters and people's experiences are what really make communication. It is an interactive process. This is probably the most simplistic communication model out there. There are models that have everything, interference, noise, con the, the situational context, all of the different things that influence communication. But at the very least, you know that people have filters that the information is coming from. You know, I remember when my daughter was little, I was trying to teach her her colors, and I had these Easter eggs, and I was showing her these different colored Easter eggs. And so my husband came home, and I said, look, I taught Logan her colors. And I held up this one egg, and I said, what color is this, Logan? And she said, blue. And I'm like, look at that. And then, and then he held up another one. He said, what color is this? It was yellow. And she said, blue. And then we went through three or four. He goes, so now our daughter thinks the word blue means egg. And, um, you know, in her context, she wasn't seeing the color. She was seeing the shape. And so this becomes really important in every communication situation you find yourself in. Because in communication, audience is everything. If you really want to communicate, you have to think about who is my audience. And who is the audience I am speaking to? What level of knowledge do they have? How professional do I need to be? You know, how do I relate to this audience? What information is relevant to them? Audience should shape all presentations that you give. And so when you are giving an assignment to a student, you want to talk about who is the audience. You know, are they just talking to their classmates? You are in this class, you are giving a presentation to your classmates who have this class. That's perfectly legitimate. But if you want them to be more professional in what they do, you might say, in this class, you're going to pretend that these are your colleagues and, and you're giving a professional presentation and give that context. You know, there may be times where you're inviting in guest speakers. I know um, when I taught a public relations course, we did a real campaign and pitched it to, to uh, people in the community that we had taken on as clients. So they have to respond to those folks. You know, what level of sophistication is this? If you are giving an engineering presentation to other engineers, then you can speak at a certain level. If you are giving an engineering presentation to a group of people who may be users but don't understand the back end of it, you have to speak to their experience. So it becomes really important to talk to your students about what your expectation is as to who's the audience, right? And so you want to make sure that you discuss that with them. Now, another part that's very important when you're giving uh, presentations in a class is to remind students and for you to hold them accountable for well-structured speeches. This is really important. They should have learned by the time they come to you what a good speech looks like. And we're going to talk about those elements for a minute. But in your evaluation form, when you develop an evaluation metric, you should have those things in there. So if you want them to have you know, the various elements that are important, you need to put them on the sheet that you're using to evaluate them. You need to make sure they're looking at this. And this is something they may be used to with, you know, and uh, you may have been like me as a professor. You give them a paper, and they give it back, and you've marked them down for their, you know, their poor writing. And they say, well, this isn't an English class. What are you doing? You know, that you shouldn't, you, why are you grading my writing? Um, and the same is kind of true with public speaking. They often think if I get sort of the nuts and bolts of the content, but my speech is horribly designed, it's OK. Well, if you want their speech to be well structured, you need to make sure that the way you assess them includes some of those elements. And you want to review that with them immediately. So if you give an assignment and you have the evaluation form, my suggestion is you pass that out and you kind of go through that to say, here are the things that I'm going to be looking for in your presentation. And that way, they know that expectation from the beginning. And when it comes to a well-structured speech, the three elements that you're really looking for, the three main parts are your intro, your body, and your conclusion. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty elementary. I will tell you right off the bat, that most speeches that I hear are missing at least one, if not two, of these elements. Very few of them to have any sort of intro. They kind of go in. And more often than not, there is no conclusion whatsoever. People will just get to the end, and they'll just say, well, I guess that's it, you know, or I'm done, or you know, they just awkwardly stop. And, and it takes what would have otherwise been a great speech and destroys it. So thinking about these three elements is very critical to helping your students design speeches that are really going to allow them to stand out when they become professionals and really have them give presentations you're proud of in your classroom. 
Now, when it comes to the introduction, there are um, several parts that you may want to consider, and I would strongly recommend you, even if in your evaluation form you just say you're going to be looking for an introduction, I'd put these in parentheses as a reminder to them. But the first one is an attention getter. Okay? Why is an attention getter so important? Because every single one of us in every speech we ever hear is sitting out there like we're on our couch at home with a giant remote control getting ready to decide if we're changing the channel. And if we don't immediately get engaged, we're off daydreaming somewhere. Um, I will tell you, my, mine is I will often be thinking about what I'm going to do if I hit the lottery. Um, so that's what I think about. If, if suddenly a school of arts and media show up, or building for arts and media show up, it's named the Q and I'm gone, I hit the lotto. But um, that's, uh, that's something that people need. To be immediately engaged, you get their attention. You also want to make sure you tell them the specific purpose, why you're there. What is the reason that you are giving this speech? That is very important to help the audience member become engaged. And, and for them to know, okay, this is what this speech is about, and now as I listen to this presentation, I'm going to be able to follow it. And then you want to have a preview. We in communication are big on previews, transitions, and summaries. I'm going to mention them a few times. And this is for several reasons. One is that most people aren't really listening to much of what you're saying, okay? They're listening to some of it. If you think about your education, how many of you have ever been trained in listening? except for musicians, and that's a different kind of listening. Okay, in psychiatry and counseling, you're trained in listening. Most of us take a million courses on reading, a million courses on writing, a million, in, not a million, but some courses in speaking, but we never take courses in listening, which is probably the most important skill that you can develop. And so people aren't very good listeners. They're not very focused listeners. And so you want to make sure that you are helping them. Previews and summaries help them follow what you're talking about, but it also helps to, um, to, to re-engage them if they forget, right? If, they're, or if they haven't been listening, they can jump back in. So teaching your students to do this will help them when they're in, as professionals, when they're trying to teach something to their staff, when they're trying to persuade someone to, to listen to a proposal they're giving. Repeating those things will really help them be more effective. And it's also important that they establish credibility depending on the, the situation. So like today, Amy introduced me, so she gave me some credibility. Um, and so that, that helps. Sometimes that will help happen for you. Sometimes the context of the presentation, you're an expert, everybody knows who you are, that's fine. But if you have students who really are developing their expertise in a field, you might want to talk to them about trying to establish credibility, whether it's citing a source, talking about their background in that area, just very briefly so that people know to listen to them and, the, and then what they say is important. Uh, of course, the main portion of your speech is the body, and I would stress that to them because I have had people who've given introductions that take longer than the actual speech, which is terrible. They start off with some giant story that goes on for 25 minutes, and they never get to the body. So you want to talk to them about balancing that. But one of the things I've seen repeatedly in presentations, not only with students but also professional presentations, is many times people don't think about the organizational structure. They just kind of get up there and ramble all over the place, and so it's very difficult to follow. So talking to your students about defining what their main points are, supporting those points with evidence, citing sources in the speech, you know, because this is something that's very important, is to get students used to mentioning the sources when they talk about the data. Uh, this is something that if we want to train them to be critical listeners, I mean, you can listen to political speeches all day long and they never cite a source. And then they'll contradict each other, and they never cite a source. I mean, my entire childhood, I used to hear that four out of five dentists surveyed recommend sugarless gum. You know, they then later made that a spoof where a squirrel would come and attack the fifth one that didn't say yes. But I always remember thinking, who were those dentists? You know, who are these people that got surveyed? And so this is something that, as a critical thinker, that you want your student to become, you want them to listen for, well, where'd that come from? Where is that evidence from? So teaching them to do that is also very, very important. And then, as I mentioned before, having those transitions. So when you talk to your students, again, you can make these criteria that you're evaluating on, or you can say, in the body of this speech, I expect to see the following. Just as a reminder to them, you know, and you decide how you want to weight it, but it, it's up to you. But I think reminding them at the very least is important. And then, Believe it or not, probably the most important part of your speech, the conclusion. <laughs> when they have done studies of people in, in, in speech communication, what they have found is that people tend to remember the conclusion more than anything else. Conclusion gets remembered the most, introduction next, body last. 
That's another reason why those previews and summaries are important. But you get somebody's attention with a good conclusion, I mean, with a good intro, and then you follow up with a good conclusion. This will help your students come off as polished. This is the mark of a good public speaker, and this will help them tremendously in their careers. When you get to the conclusion, you want to signal that you're there. You know, they should say something like, in conclusion, my final thoughts, or whatever. They should never false close, and that is something you want to mention to them. False close is when you say, well, and in the conclusion, as I summarize, I'm going to continue, you know, one last point, you keep going. When you say you're finishing, finish. If you do not, your students will become vicious in the classroom, their audience will become unhappy. Even if your speech is short, if you keep going, people get upset. So you say you're in conclusion. This is important because it signals to the audience if they've sort of tuned out a bit, ooh, tune back in, we're at the end, and, the, and, they will, and they will tune back in. Again, restate that specific purpose and main points because it's important to reiterate. I mean, many of you who've heard me speak I said, I don't know, probably a thousand times, unparalleled commitment to every student's success. That was deliberate. When you walked out, I wanted to make sure that was what everybody remembered, and so I knew I had to say it at least 10 times. I mean, I literally counted how many times it was in the speech to make sure it got, it got reinforced. And then, and most importantly, you want to provide a memorable conclusion. It can be a tie back to something you said at the end. It can be a quote, a statistic, just a really well thought out final statement. But having that well-polished final statement where it is clear you are done leaves a very important impression on an audience. It really elevates your level of professionalism, and it is so important for our students to think about this because, again, as I said a moment ago, so many people say they get to the end and they're like, well, okay, well, I guess that's it. You know, uh, Do you have any questions? And I would also stress don't ask if there's any questions. Try to train them not to ask until there's an applause. When you have a well-designed speech, people know it's the ending. And then they applaud. And then you ask if there are any questions. And that is something that will really help elevate your students as speakers and the impression that their speeches give. Now, when it comes to group speeches, because I know many of you in business and other areas are having students give group presentations. What I would say in that case is talk to them about the format that you want or if you don't care, give them options. So in other words, you can have the entire presentation function like one speech. So somebody, typically like an MC person, will do the intro, they do the transitions, they do the conclusion, and then everyone else talks about main points. Or the students may set it up that everybody does you know, a full speech with, with all the elements. Either way works fine for group presentation. You really need to think about what's best for your class and in the environment and for your students when they become professionals and help, help them decide what's going to be the best way to do this. But what I would stress, and I would mark off any student presentation that's a group presentation where people have different looking PowerPoints where it, you can tell they just threw it all together at the last minute. One student talks for 10 minutes, one talks for two. Some of them repeat each other. You know, It needs to be a cohesive presentation where they've worked together, they're covering different material, it flows logically. It should flow like a speech. And if their PowerPoint presentations are in different font, color, style, you know, then that is, is not professional and something that you should definitely mark, mark um, them down for. Another best practice is to time your students. And um, I know some of you may have opportunities where you give your kids, you know, like 45 minutes and they might have a chance to talk at the end and ask questions and, and you, you're not actually working with a timer. But I would recommend working with a timer, and here's why. Most professional places you go have timers. I don't know about you, but I've been on panels at conferences where the panel's given 45 minutes and we had a bad moderator and somebody talked too long at the beginning and the poor person at the end had no time left whatsoever. I have been lecturing in a class and I hit my 50 minute mark and I lost track of time and they all packed up and let me know they were done, you know. Um, so, so timing matters. I, I, have, I see Frank Spaniel out there. He's one of my indicators. So Amy looks at me and I look at Frank. When speeches go too long, it's very hard for me not to show discomfort. So Amy watches to see if I start like making faces and then she sends me mean text messages. Um, and, and I watch Frank. So, uh, you know, it, it is, we do definitely, you can definitely tell 
that speeches should be a certain length and go too long. Um, commencement is another one. I'm up on stage. I see you all start squirming when a commencement speaker goes too long. You're all like, are you serious? Let's go wrap it up. So, you know, it is important to get our students to think about that and, and to work through that. Actually, when I very first started, the thing I touched on my on my phone here was because I had forgot to turn my timer on and it keeps shutting off. So I'm making sure I stay within my time limit. Now, when it comes to uh, speeches, one of the, the subjects that is most important to talk about is PowerPoint. In the field of communication, there was actually an article written not long after the PowerPoint um, software came out, and the title of the article was PowerPoint is Evil. We in the field of communication are not big fans because PowerPoint is not the speech. Everyone makes PowerPoint the speech. PowerPoint is a visual aid. That's it. And so speakers need to remember they should be the main focus, not the PowerPoint. They are the speaker. At the moment you make the speaker irrelevant and it's all about the PowerPoint, you have lost every battle for giving a good, meaningful, memorable speech. And so that becomes, that becomes very difficult. I will be honest, you know, if, 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 um, if we weren't in legislative session, I would have had this whole thing memorized. I do have to look at my notes a little bit. But usually when I speak, I memorize everything I'm going to say, and I would never use a podium. That's why they always have me a head mic, so I can be, you know, I can be out this way, and that helps make you front and center. Um, I got to go to Austin a lot, so I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and it was 45 minutes. But, um, but I did, you know, it is important to make yourself front and center in a speech, particularly as a professional, because you want your students to establish themselves as the leader or as someone who should be looked at as a leader, someone who is professional in what they can do, and that they are the most important thing in terms of the, the distribution of that knowledge. When we look at best practices related to PowerPoint, you want to, first of all, avoid slides that are too text heavy. And I'm going to have some examples here in a moment. But you know, we've all seen them. There's so much font on there that it is, it is too text heavy and, and people cannot read it. You have to be very careful about font size. I mean, this is an ongoing battle. I'm going to self-critique right now. When I give the faculty staff presentations, I am unhappy with the, the way that screen works. I can't figure out anything to get on it that you can read. And so I'm trying to figure out, okay, how can I make these speeches work and share information, but not that the screen is too far back and the, you know, you, it, you, I can have one word on there. That's about it. That's easily read. Um, so it becomes really important. Your color choice is important. Talk to students about these things. If you're giving, if you have an eight o'clock class and your students walk in to give a presentation, just like an eight o'clock business meeting, if you have a, a choice in PowerPoint that you have to turn the lights down to be able to see it, You've just put your whole everyone to sleep. I mean, they're done. They will, they will fall asleep, and so you need to think about that. Is it easily seen? Sometimes something looks very nice on a small screen. You need to step back and look at it. Using either li very light backgrounds with, with black or very um, dark backgrounds with white are usually the easiest things to spot. But that is critically important. Another thing that's important is that you should have slides that are self-explanatory that it's not too complicated. There are some exceptions. If you're talking about a process or you're trying to teach people something, you might have to actually talk about the slide and reference the slide. I have seen far too many students turn and say, well, in this picture up here, what I'm showing is this, and then that picture is this, and this picture is that. That is terrible. They should never, ever do that. They've been told not to do that in public speaking. So you want to make sure that your slides are there to support but that they are not you know, the main focus of the presentation. And students should always be ready to speak without slides. And that's what I was going to compliment Don Melrose on. We recently had a lunch and learn where he spoke to President Circle. The whole system went down. It like just everything, every catastrophe you could imagine happened. And Don kept right on going like it never, it never faced him. He just kept giving his presentation. Um, I've, I've learned because I, um, when I speak in the community a lot about the university, I have a few graphs that I use, and, and typically that's about it, you know, and most of it's just presentations, but I've learned to print out copies just in case it goes down, so that I can, you know, if I want to show that information, uh, depending on the group, if it's really important, I can pass that out, but you always have to be prepared to speak without th the slides, and if they can't do it, then they're, they're, not, they're not really developing a very well-designed speech.
So here's some examples um, that I think these are obnoxious and a little over the top, but I've seen things close to this. Uh, this is one with too much text, but all of us have seen the ones that have tons of text and someone just reads the whole thing and it's horrible and dreadful. Um, this is an example of graphs. I have seen ones this bad. I've sadly probably have used one this small in the past. I apologize. But putting up graphs that nobody can read, that are too small, that have too much data, you know, that is, again, another big no-no. And then things like this. Use of color is very important. This is horrible. Um, and, and, and so you want to really think about your color choices. Simplistic is better. Calm is better, you know, and something that's easy for the audience. I also remind my students that are younger that um, some of us have older eyes and maybe can't see as well from a distance. So, you know, when they're looking at the font size, they should think about different, different um, seeing abilities. I, I really, I got, I bought contacts recently. I finally had to give up and get glasses. I bought contacts and I cannot get them in my eye. So, um, so I still can't read anything, um, but I'm trying. So if you see me and I look like I've been beat up, it's probably because I've been trying to stick the contact in my eye. Now, when it comes to PowerPoint, it, we have to mention delivery because one of the things that happens with PowerPoint is that people will read the slides as if it is their speech. They put a ton of text on there, and worse yet, they turn their back on the audience and they start reading their PowerPoint. Um, that, that can't happen. All right, so that is absolutely the worst thing that a student could do in terms of losing an audience, losing credibility. So they either have to work to have a monitor where they can cheat, like I've got a cheat monitor back there, so when I flip the slides, I can make sure they're flipped, or you can have a, a classmate flip for you, you know, or, or whatever works for you. Sometimes the laptop is here so you can see it. Um, Claire usually does it for me when I'm doing larger presentations, but I go off script all the time, so I make her insane because she's trying to figure out where I am, and I'm just like randomly going all around. But, um, you know, you want to make sure that you are really focusing on the audience, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. You also want to avoid the biggest trap of PowerPoint, and that's getting boxed in. Many times people have a laptop and not a clicker, they have a mic like this, which, you know, I have, a, I have a head mic because I like to speak with my hands and I like to not be boxed in. Um, but if you have a laptop that you have to keep clicking and you're behind this thing and the, and the podium's down, you literally box in the speaker. You put them in a tiny box and it's very hard for them. And when I talk about delivery here in a moment, just realize that is the one of the worst things you can do to have an effective delivery. And so when you're looking at how you set up your classroom and how you set that structure up, think about those things so you don't limit your students. The other thing that I would stress that you should mention to students as a best practice is that particularly people who are afraid of public speaking will spend a lot of time on their slides. They spend all their time designing their slides. They don't actually put their speech together. They don't have an intro and conclusion. They kind of just read their slides and they have a horrible delivery because they've never actually practiced their speech. I usually put the speech together first and then put the slides together. Unless, I, you know, unless I'm just doing nothing but pictures, which um, with the TED Talk thing, that's kind of popular right now. So you just give your speech and, and you use the pictures. Um, in which case, I kind of have to think of them simultaneously. But for any speaker, you, know, you want to make sure that they are spending time developing the speech, not 95% of their time on slides, and, and then their speeches just really suffer. So here are some communication essentials that um, are related to not only PowerPoint, but to all of delivery, regardless of the speech that you give. One is that you should make eye contact with your audience. For students who are very afraid, this is really hard. They're like, I don't want to look at, I'm going to look down the whole time, which actually probably makes them more nervous. Um, one of the things I tell students to do, and it, it, it always works, is you look for your smilers and your nodders. Every audience has smilers and nodders, and you look at them, and they give you reassurance, and you keep looking at them, and it's okay. Uh, one of the hardest venues for me to speak in is the pack, because the way the lights are, I can't see the audience. Now, for some people, they like that. I hate that, because you, when you're seeing people that are sh you know, shaking their head and smiling, it gives you energy and it gives you feedback. And so not being able to see the audience is very hard. But if that is something they're afraid of, you know, talk to them about that as something that they should focus on. Another thing, as I said, you don't want to read your slides, nor do you want to read a manuscript. Let them know 
that if you are just going to read something in front of me, if you're just going to read it, just turn it in as a paper. A speech is not a paper. You don't just read your, your presentation. You, it is written differently. It is delivered differently when, when you are speaking. I mean, most of the papers we write, academic papers in particular, have very long, complex sentences. That is typically not how a speech is delivered. It is delivered in a, in a, in a you can have a formal speaking, but it is usually delivered in a different fashion. And so when people are just trying to memorize or read a presentation, it is it's usually very ineffective. Also, the ideal that you want to go for is a conversational style, like, like this that I'm using right now. The best way to do that is to never use a manuscript to just speak from an outline. And that is something your students have learned in their classes, and that is something that you should try to push them toward, is having a conversational delivery style, because it does add tremendously to how audiences perceive someone's credibility. And when they become professionals in the workplace, they may be incredibly bright, but if they are tied to their notes and they are reading their notes, they're going to be seen as, as, as less um, knowledgeable. And so helping them guide their way through this is important. But more than anything, the most important thing to do, I would say, is just take a small amount of time in your class, because they've talked about this in public speaking and other courses, but take a small amount of time and talk to them about their own delivery or your own fears and your, your issues that you have related to delivery and have an actual discussion about it, even if it's just a small discussion at the end of a class. You know, when I walked up here to start speaking, I was nervous. I mean, I was really nervous. I was originally expecting this was going to be 10 people. And then I heard it was lots of people, and I was like, oh, man. And so I was, I was very nervous. But it's, um, it's important that, that they learn what their weaknesses are so that they can, that they can work through it. Oops a laser. So here's some of the things I think you should mention if, you know, when you're talking about this. All of us, if we're good speakers, get a giant adrenaline rush. When you get up in front of a group, it is natural to have an adrenaline rush for all of us. If you don't, your speech will probably be terrible. It will fall flat. It will be boring. Okay, so they have to think of that adrenaline rush as a good thing. I tell them, think about, you know, if you play a sport. Before a sport, people are in a locker room. I didn't play a sport, but people are in a locker room, and they're, they get all fired up, and, you know, they're getting very excited before they go out because you don't want to run, run out in the field without that adrenaline going. And so it's important. So what then, they, then they have to learn is how does that adrenaline affect me? And how do I deal with how it affects me? It affects all of us differently. So when they hit that, when they hit that speech, how does that affect me? And you can talk to them about it a little bit. Um, I always give an example. When I, the very first speech I gave to a large audience, I was in ninth grade. I was in my junior high. And I was running for class president. And so I got to give a speech. And I never, uh, there was about 400 kids in the room. I'd never um, presented to a group that large. And I got up and I gave my speech and everything was fine and it ended and I had this like just massive, I don't even know what happened. It still happens to me. I get more nervous when my speech ends. I can't tell you how it went. I can't tell you what I even said in my speech. It's like the moment it's over, there's this weird you know, thing that happens. So I didn't know that was going to happen to me. It did. I went to sit down afterwards. There were three of us running and um, the other kid got up and I went to sit down and I was so nervous I missed my chair. So I sat between two chairs. The chairs slid apart. I go flying to the ground. Brian Clapper, I remember his name to this day, reached out and grabbed me so I didn't hit the floor. Planted one leg, caught my balance. I was in a dress. I proceeded to flash the entire ninth grade. So it was like, oh, this is the most embarrassing. I'm horrified. And, um, and at that moment, I learned something very important, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but I'm going to save that st the rest of that story for a minute. But you want to make sure you know this. And I tell my students you know, about all kinds of things that I have done. I I'll give them examples. I'll say, you know, um, things can happen to you in a speech. Like you could sit on the edge of a desk and the desk could flip over. You could pull too hard on, on the screen and the screen could fall down and then suddenly you think you're a soccer player and you try to stop it with your foot and then your whole ankle swells up. You could go to open a carbonated beverage, which they should never drink in a speech. It could start to explode. You could become nervous and throw it into the audience and now it explodes on everyone. I literally did every one of those things. So they were all me. At some point, I had done those. But letting them know that you know, everyone has a different kind of thing, and how do you deal with it? Some of the tips that you can give them, again, they should have heard these, but it is, it is always important if you ask them, what are you nervous about? What are you afraid of? How does adrenaline affect you? You can give them some tips. So for vocal, that's one thing they get nervous about. They're too quiet. We have some students that are very quiet. 
It's simple enough. You look at the back of the room, and when you begin speaking, you know, I look at Andy Piker, and I'm going to talk to Andy. And if I set my volume to talk to Andy, I should be fine. Some folks speak too quickly. That's me. I speak fast to begin with. When I get nervous, I speak faster. Um, I write all over my notes, slow down. You know, uh, another thing, two other things that can help students is to have a beverage, uh, water, that they can take a sip. It kind of calms them and slows them. Don't pick carbonated ever. Um, the other one is, is to take five deep breaths. They say, you know, five, three to five deep breaths before you start, and it helps to calm you a little bit to slow you down. I will stress that I have told students that, and then they've gotten in front of the audience, and they stand there for a minute, and they go, you know, and I say, no, do it before, before you, uh, you come. Um, and so uh, yeah, that's not good. Um, another thing that, that you need to think about, as I said, eye contact, telling them about looking at the smilers and the people that isn't important, you know, but it is very important for them to work on eye contact. Another one people will get is th th their mouth will become very dry. That's also, again, having some water is helpful. But the other great thing about having a drink is that if you lose your place for any reason, you can just go and you just take your drink and then you're and people just think you're having a drink, you're figuring out where you are. And then you can keep going and no one knows. No one is the wiser that for a moment you needed to think about where you were in a speech. So there's a dull purpose there. I, however, speak with my hands, and um, that's certainly another one is uh, people who have a lot of energy in their hands and feet. I am one of those people. I can't not talk with my hands, so I can never use a, a computer. I always have a clicker with me and a head mic because um, I, I, if I'm boxed in, I, I don't do very well. And that's what I was saying about PowerPoint. People who are boxed in really have, that's a problem if you want to use your hands. I will say if you do talk with your hands, be very careful where you place your beverage. I've knocked a ton of them over, which is always embarrassing. But also tell your students you know, it's okay to walk around. So that if you, know, if you set up a, a proper setup for public speaking that they could walk around when they talk. And believe it or not, you know, both Clorinda and I walk around when we give speeches. Not because we're confident, because we're nervous. Um, walking around when you have a lot of nervous energy in your feet and hands actually really helps you quite a bit, and I can cheat and get out far enough that I can see people's faces on the stage. But um, you know, those are strategies. Some other things that we'll have students say, some students will begin to sweat or they will turn red. There's absolutely nothing you can do about that. That just happens, you know, and you just tell them to dress in natural fibers are better. They tend to help with that a bit. Um, and that's also a good conversation to have because it allows you to talk about appropriate dress. We have lots of students, if you're giving a professional's presentation in your class, tell them the expectation of the clothes that you want them to wear. Should they dress like a professional? Now remember, they may not own suits. You know, they may not own things. So talk, give them alter, um, alternatives that they could wear uh, if they, you know, depending on the, the uh, clothes they might have at that age. I mean, if you've got graduating seniors, they should have purchased a suit probably to interview, but make sure you work with them there. But I will say I see a lot of folks show up, um, and particularly women, in shoes that are way too high. They don't wear heels normally, and they show up in hugely you know, high heels. And so talk to them about you know, small, if you're going to have heels, make them small, um, and skirts that are way too short. And so that's one of the things is giving your students some examples of what professional attire looks like is important because you want them to learn to look professional. With men, the interesting thing I often see is um, they will come with either white gym socks or um, no socks because they hadn't planned that when they got their suit. And then when they sit down, you know, you can see that. Now these cute weird socks are in right now, so that might be okay for a short period of time. But, um, <laughs> but that, is a real, that is a real issue. And so talking to them about, you know, what does professional attire look like? Or at the very least, on the day you're showing up to speak, maybe you're not requiring them to dress in business attire. But they should at least have something on that's, that's, you know, not a pair of short shorts and a shirt that says some writing on it because the writing will distract from them. So teaching them those things, having those conversations is going to help you in terms of developing them as professionals. And you can really do it in a relatively short period of time. The other biggest thing to tell students when it comes to delivery and fear is to practice. The number one thing is counterintuitive, but the most important thing you can do to develop your speaking skills is practice. The more you do it, the more you realize what your um, nervous tics are, what your issues are, and you can learn to develop around that and develop yourself as a speaker. A couple other essentials just to mention um, is, are that uh, 
you want to treat public speaking with a sense of play. And when I was mentioning a moment ago about flashing the audience, right, when I was in the ninth grade, um, I was, I was devastated, so I snuck downstairs to the bathroom, or the basement of my junior high, which I lived then in a place that had basements, and I had to call on a payphone because nobody had a cell phone yet, and I called my mother, and I was in tears, and I'm like, what am I going to do? Everyone's going to make fun of me, and she said, just pretend you don't care. And I said, what? She goes, just pretend like you don't care. So I went up and everyone tried to make, you know, anyone who made a comment, I'm like, I don't care. I did, and I was trying really hard not to get upset. But by day two, they quit saying anything about it. It wasn't, it was not, you know, valuable to them since I didn't seem to care. And um, then when I got into college, I studied communication, and uh, Sigmund Freud, I know that's uh, Pam's favorite, uh, Sigmund Freud said that, uh, that dealing with people who had this fear of public speaking, that they needed to treat it with a sense of play. When something goes wrong, you don't act like you're, you know, you're in a, in a special world where you can't talk about it. Something happens, something goes wrong, you can address it. If you lose your place, you don't want to announce, oh my goodness, I've lost my place. But you would say, give me one second and you'll figure out where you're at. If something goes horribly wrong, you have to address it. The worst thing you can do is ignore it. And I stress to students that um, most audience members are rooting for you. If you have ever watched someone struggling with public speaking, I mean, my heart breaks for them. I want to get up and give them a hug. I mean, it's like, come on, you can do it. And you're, the audience is rooting for you if you are nervous with your speeches. And that becomes incredibly important for the, for the student to remember, is that people aren't out there ready, you know, with rotten tomatoes, ready to throw them at you. They're trying to help you. When I very first came here, uh, my very first year here, I was doing a, a training for CCAD. And um, I had this sense of play really reiterated in me, and, and, um, and it really kind of changed my, how important I realized that part of understanding public speaking is. I was giving a presentation. It was at 5 in the morning. They get up really early there. And so I had to get up at 3. I started the presentation at 5. It was actually in CCH at the time. And I, had, I wasn't hungry, so I had some orange juice, and I start giving this presentation. And so as I'm speaking, I start seeing these dots. And I'm seeing the dots every, and I'm like, what is that? And then all of a sudden, I hear wah, wah, wah in my ear. And the next thing I know, I wake up, and I have passed out. And I was like, oh, my gosh. What just, I mean, that never happened in my life. And it's very weird. You wake up very refreshed, like you took a long nap. <laughs> but um, it was bizarre. So, you know, I, the, I, the, I, I, then I got an eating disorder because the nurse came over at the time and said, are you okay? Do you have an eating disorder? And then she looked at me, and she goes, oh, no. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, well, that wasn't very nice. You know, she gave me some peanut butter. I went off on, I went off on my way. I had to come back and speak. I had three engagements with this group. I'd just gotten out of grad school, and I spent the whole check immediately. And so I had to keep coming back. So I came back to the day number, the, the second presentation, like a week later. I'd been trying to get into the doctor because it was kind of weird. Why did I faint? But I didn't know. So I come back. Still, I'm not hungry this morning. I drink two glasses of orange juice this time, so I have energy, and I'm giving my speech. All of a sudden, it starts happening again. I start seeing dots. I start hearing that noise, and I panic. They're all men in my training, and it was um, the classroom that's that used to be classrooms across from the, from the bathroom. So I thought, I'm going to get to the ladies' room and pass out in private. That was my thinking. I will run to the ladies' room and pass out in private was a really bad thought. If you're going to faint, don't run. So I started running, and apparently this time I passed out mid-stride. Like, like right, you know, as I'm right out there, boom, I'm out. So... Um, so Tito was, Guerrero was then our provost. He comes down to check on me. They're like, what is wrong with this person? You know, um, so I finally get into a doctor. It turns out I'm hypoglycemic, and I was drinking orange juice on no food in my stomach, and then it would burn off. And it, so I, I avoid orange juice, um, and I, you know, I, I, I don't, especially on an empty stomach, I'm much carefuler now. But I had to go back in front of these people again. I mean, I pass out twice. I'm humiliated. I'm like, oh my God, what is going to happen? So I go in, and they're all like, are you okay? And I told them what happened. And they were so funny. They took a poll as to what time I would pass out in this class period. <laughs> One gentleman came and rubbed my arm. He said he was very sorry. He gave me a ho. Um, someone else, uh, they, they recommended my workshops to every single one of their friends because you got extra long breaks while I recovered from fame.
campaigning. Um, you know, they were they were taking polls as you know to to whether or not I was pregnant or had a brain tumor or what was going on. I was like, no, I'm just hyperglycemic. But um, they, and they la and we laughed about it. And you know, and so every so often, one of them would say, all right, how you doing? You know, they were checking in on me. And it just, it made me realize this is a group of people I've not known. I've really humiliated myself in front of them twice. And yet they were rooting for me to do well. They wanted to see me succeed because that's what most people do for speakers. And having your students know that about you, having your students know that about the audience, reminding them of that, helps to give them the confidence to build their public speaking. Usually the students who are most afraid of it actually design the best speeches. The ones who are a little cocky and think their delivery is great, they're usually the ones who give you bad speeches. And so, you know, you may want to mention that to them. A shiny delivery with a poor content is not going to get you a passing grade. And, um, and so it is very important to really talk about those things as it relates to public speaking and know that this is a skill that is essential for students if we want to see them succeed. It is something that will set them apart from their colleagues. It is something that will help them develop as professionals. And it is something that you want to really instill in your students that they do well. So today I hope that I've been able to share with you some communication essentials that we build all great speeches, uh, all great speeches are built upon, and to share with you some best practices that will help you as you're working with your students to develop them as speakers. If you ever have questions, myself or anyone in the comm department, I'm sure would be happy to talk to you about challenges that, that you've seen in your classroom or things you might be able to do to help your students improve, because it is, it is a difficult thing to learn. And students don't get a lot of background and training in this. And they often develop their speeches on examples that they've seen and unfortunately most examples aren't very good speakers. So you really want to help them learn to develop themselves as speakers. And I want to end with a quote um, and this is really something, this is a variation on, on something I see every single year. Fortune 500 companies every single year put a, out a survey on the skills they most want to see in the people they hire. And always, always, the number one skill is communication, verbal and uh, written communication skills. And th this latest article that just came out called Characteristics of a Successful Employee for a Fortune 500 Company, the opening quote is, communication skills have always been critical for success for employees and organizations of any size. In Fortune 500 companies, these skills are even more critical. And they go on to talk about that. Now, we're talking specifically about public speaking right now, but if you can get your students to think about how they're delivering their message and think about the importance of audience, it will help build them across all communication contexts. If you can get them to think about the way they are being perceived when they deliver a message, it, again, will help them in all communication contexts. So I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and to share something that I personally um, have spent 30 years being pretty passionate about. Thank you. So I'll be happy to take any questions, and I will point out there is a typo in my opening slide. There should be an apostrophe. Um, so anyway, I did catch that, but unfortunately after I got here. Yes. Did you win the election? I did win the election. Yes, I did. I won the election that year and again in 12th grade. So. <laughs> Well, so one of the things we do in, in, when I taught public speaking, and this may sound horrifically terrible, but what we would do is we, I would make them do impromptu speeches. They tend to have the most ums. And sometimes it could be okay or like. I, I recently read a transcript of an interview I had, and I realized my, mine is, um, well, I mean, I mean, I say that all the time. I was like, oh, my gosh, i got to work on this. But what we do is every time they say um, we clap. So, and, and, and you work through that and you clap. What it does is makes, it makes them aware they're doing it. And vocal fillers, it's, it's when you're speaking extemporaneously or in a conversational style, they're more likely. A few of them are okay. But what, and that's probably something I should have included here. You have to tell them it's okay to pause. There's allowed to be a moment of silence where they think, because that's really what that um is. It's, I, I feel like there should be a sound in here before I say my next thought. But you can tell them, you know, when you're practicing, have somebody listen and clap. It'll get them over it pretty quickly. And, and, and um, I have not had anyone ever come back to me and say, you have traumatized me for all time. So, so I, hopefully I haven't. Good. Other questions? Yes.
Well, so what we do, we, when we teach public speaking online, which um, I was very opposed to that in the beginning, and my daughter's actually taking a dual credit course at, at her high school, which is going to be public speaking online, and I was horrified, and a little piece of me died. I was like, what? <laughs> no, you have to take it with it. But um, they, they have them speak to a real audience. So they require them to video it. When they video it, they scan to the audience, and then they come back so that they are speaking they are speaking to a real audience. That helps a little bit. It, it, is, it is harder to um, grade some elements of the speech when you don't, you know, when you when you are not there in person. But but you can definitely you can definitely help them improve. Maybe just not to that same level. I, I'd also say it is hard to grade speeches when you don't do it all the time and you're trying to listen for all of these different elements. Um, you know, it, it, it's a little bit tricky, and so sometimes you may want to video or record the speeches or, you know, or even just audio tape the content to make sure you didn't miss something. Uh, but learning, I will tell you that learning to train yourself to listen to speeches for various parts and clarity and evidence and so on is a, it's just an incredibly beneficial skill. Um, it, it, is, it has probably helped me more in my own career than anything else, to be able to listen and, and to try to listen to what people are saying and really get the message and not get caught up in, um, in sometimes emotion, when people have emotion, because you're trying to make sure you're getting the facts. Are they all there? You know, is the people covering everything? And am I not being distracted by someone who has poor delivery? And um, by training yourself to do that, it actually can help you in other contexts as well. Right. Um, you've got several options. Some people will watch themselves in a mirror. I can't do that. They'll have a mirror, so they're actually seeing themselves. That freaks me out completely. I cannot do that. Um, I would actually, if you can, get some colleagues or even a few people to be there to watch you. Um, some people can do it. I know I can never speak as, I, I always speak better when there's an audience. I mean, I just, um, there's just something that you get from an audience. So, you know, you may exchange that with some colleagues or, or you know, talk to some graduate students or something, have them give you some feedback on how to improve. Make it meaningful for the people listening. But uh, if, if I were in that circumstance, I'd have to at least have a small audience. I, I could not do it flat. I mean, that, I would find that very, very difficult. Has anyone ever videoed themselves with no audience? And, and how were you able to, were you, how would you, did you do that? You just pretend like they're there? And so you're talking about recording when there's nobody there at all? Yeah. So, and you're doing it where you can actually see the students, so you know you have an audience. Right. And then record it. <laughs> and then you do it. <laughs> That's a good idea. Good. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh. Right. That's good. Well, and, you know, I, this is, um, in the time that I've been teaching this, it's, it's, you know, always a little bit of a struggle with students. And it's really going to be interesting to see how this group that we have right now respond to public speaking. Because on the one hand, they are very um, social media oriented, so they don't, you know, I'll, they'll be in a room with each other, not talking to each other. They're just texting each other in the same room. My daughter has sleepovers where they make no noise, and that, when I was a kid and that happened, you were up to something bad, and you go in and they're just all, I hate it, they're all on the phone, but yet they also will make all these videos. They're always making videos and doing, all, so they may be great performers when it comes time for public speaking. You know, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, various social media and other outlets will impact them as, as speakers. Jennifer? Um, do you have advice for a faculty member when their students are at the front of the room giving their speeches? And I've had a situation where I've had a handful of students 
it first through the fear. And then all of a sudden the emotion in the room, and it's not just for the student, but all of their classmates. And in the other case is where I've had students who, I guess, can get a version of stage fright and completely forget everything. Yeah. So I would I would say a couple things. One is that particularly if you know the student's nervous and that they have prepared because sometimes it can be lack of preparation. But you could just say, you know, give them some kind of an out like saying, this is probably the you know, not the best time for this presentation. Why don't we just wait? Or you can ask them. But I would always ask like sometimes they want to continue through it. Um, I have had, when teaching public speaking, they can pick their own top topics, and sometimes they'll, and I will say to students, really work to try to give a speech on something that's not going to make you, you know, make you cry. Although I've had times, um, you know, I had a friend pass away recently, and I just went, I was mentioning it at a meeting, and I just started crying. I was like, oh my gosh, because sometimes you think you're okay with something, and then it just hits you out of the clear blue, so sometimes that, that can happen to them. So, I mean, I think it's okay, even when you're talking about that, that to mention things like that and that they're okay and we'll work through it. I had one, one student, I adored him. Um, he, had a, he had stuttered when he was young. He had kind of gotten over it, but he was terrified that he would start stuttering in his speeches. So every class, and this is when we used to have to sign off for them to drop your class. So he came, he would come and say, I'm gonna drop your class, sign, sign the form. And I'd say, give your speech, and if you want me to sign it afterwards, I'll sign it. And every time he'd give an A speech, and they'd say, okay, I'm all right. Next speech, he'd show back up. We got through the whole semester that way, but he, he kind of needed to know he had that out. The other thing I, I also do is I threaten audiences, I'm not gonna lie. When it's student speakers, I threaten them, and I let them know that you can, you know, I have a big ego. If I see you not paying attention, if I see you doing certain things in class or talking to each other, I can handle it. You do that to one of the other students in this classroom and I cannot handle it. So you need to pay respect to one another. And I, I address that in, in every class. And if I do have someone who is, is sort of a repeat offender, I'll pull them aside and just let them know, like, I'm, I'm asking you to please make sure you give your colleagues your undivided attention. And, uh, and it usually works. Um, you mean interacting with the audience? Yes, but more purposefully. Well, there's several ways that you can do it. One of the risks that you take when you a allow audience members to start talking is that they may not stop or that no one will say anything. So, so that does become a bit, a bit risky if you're giving a form, more, of a, more of a formal presentation. So typically there you, you know, keep it to the end. Sometimes depending on the venue, you can plant questions, which I don't know if I always, you know, you can at least have a friend out there that you're like, if nobody asks anything, you know, you're going to, to ask this. If you're working with students who are working with other students, you may want to talk to them about how do you politely stop somebody like if someone is going on too long, how can you um, uh, politely get that microphone back? One of the things that's really important is if you ever go out into an audience, never turn over the mic. So if you walk out into an audience and you have a microphone, you do not let it go. That's rule number one, because you can always bring it back. As soon as you give someone the microphone, you've lost all control. So, so that's, a, that's another thing that can happen. Um, but keeping, keeping time at the end to allow for questions, and, and then you might plant a question or two that says, because once people start asking questions, people then will ask questions. If nobody asks a question, everyone gets real quiet. So um, you can say to someone, if no one asks any questions, help me out by just asking this, and, and, that, and that can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, you know, if they if they interrupt during during you know something that you can say, I'm you know I can I, um, I respectfully ask you keep your comments t toward the end, and then we will because I may address your issue during my presentation. Right. Then when you get to the end, if it's at the end or, or they're or they're asking questions, I mean I usually thank them for their opinion. 
So I say, well, I appreciate that point of view, and, and maybe you and I can chat about this a little more after this, after this venue, and then I turn it back to the group. Um, but you know, I, I usually do not engage in a debate um, with, you know, with someone in, in that kind of setting because it usually doesn't have a very productive outcome. Now, if it's a topic in which you want students to debate and, and talk about issues and they may have different sides of an opinion, that's okay. Just set ground rules. You know, there's no name calling. You have to be, you know, people get a certain amount of time. It has to be factually based, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. And you can set, you can set those sorts of parameters. Um, I, the thing that I get um, sometimes is I get interviewed a lot for different things and they'll ask questions that have nothing to do with the event. Um, or, or what you're doing. And it's really because they have not done their homework very effectively. And so you're trying to politely steer them back to that you know, you're doing your job wrong and this has nothing to do with this question has nothing to do with what this event is. And, and so you're trying to politely, politely steer them back. Um, and so what I've learned to do is I just answer the question with whatever I want to say. And it's odd that people often don't then follow up and ask that question again. You just say whatever answer you were planning to say for what would have been the right question, and they just roll with it. So sometimes when people are, are rude or they say something, you just say, well, thank you. And then you just, you just go on to whatever you were talking about. You, you haven't been rude, you've said thank you, and then you just redirect. But again, make sure you don't give up that microphone. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, you do not want someone with ITA to sit there making everybody else talk. They really need to go first. Yes. Go first. They'll want to put themselves last. But when you talk with them about communication, you're talking about how important it is to give ITA to volunteer to go first. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or the sooner you go, and, and even on the first speaking day, you know, I used to teach a class. Um, in my, it was uh, summer session two. And I taught this class for, oh gosh, for probably 15 years. And it was summer two, public speaking, and it was all graduating seniors who had put off public speaking till the very last class they had to take. And it was literally like this counseling session, and I think advisors were sending them. They knew this was the class they needed to be in, and we would talk through it. But they do really well, and summer two or Maymaster are actually great times to teach public speaking for for people with high um, communication apprehension because it's fast. They don't have time to think about it. It's just like, we're talking about it speech. We're talking about it speech. And, it, and they don't have all that time between the speeches to build up anxiety. The other thing too is to really stress, and, and I, I said this a moment ago, but I can't reiterate it enough. Um, usually the ones that are most nervous give better speeches. And they really put a lot of energy into it. Um, and, and you know, it's the kid who just rolls in, says whatever off the top of their head, and they're, they're usually the worst speeches. So, so a lot of times reminding them that actually the students who get the best grades in my class often are really nervous. I want to ask you this. Mm -hmm. As a student, I, I just want to share the trick which I did. I had to present, and I was presenting. I did not like what I was doing. I thought it was horrible, but I did uh, audio record myself and then I listened and I really liked it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just built my self esteem. No, and I, and I think that's very important. It can show you where you have flaws. It can show you how you can get better. The same holds true. One of the best ways to get, if your students are working on job interviewing, having them record themselves will really increase how well they do with the interview process. Did someone else have a hand up? Uh, Lisa? Well, and, and I think it's several things. I think it's one is talking to them about what just happened. You should have an adrenaline rush. It's a biological thing. You should have a, you don't want to not have one. So you just got to figure out how, what that does to you and then how do you address it? Because it happens to all of us. So I think that is an important piece. But then I'll, I'll, I'll almost, ever, I don't know actually any person um, that does not have communication apprehension in some group. 
So some, for some folks, it's that one-on-one -on -one conversation. They could get up and public speak in front of a thousand people and they don't care. The group, I, I will tell you, the group that I have always been most terrified to speak in front of is the College of Liberal Arts faculty. Um, and uh, so as dean, that was a little stressful. But because, you know, and, and C CLA faculty, will, they are trained critical thinkers and debaters and they will take you on in a heartbeat. And, I, and, and when I was a faculty member, and we made, we made a couple people cry. I mean, it was bad, but um, they kind of deserved it. But I mean, we were just asking good questions, but they didn't take it well. So that was the group I was always most nervous in front of. I could go speak to, you know, at that point, you know, president's cabinet, I can speak board of regents, I can speak to all those folks, and I am less nervous than in front of, you know, uh, the CLA faculty. Um, but, but that is something that um, all of us have. Uh, I, my friend Sean Wall, who used to be a faculty member here, we would walk to meetings and we would laugh because we would be going and I would say, I will not talk, I will not talk, I will not talk, because I would always volunteer for something. And Sean would be like, I will talk, I will talk, I will talk, because he would get nervous in those situations. And so it's different. For me, um, ironically, the, the place I probably get the most nervous is when I'm in like a small talk situation where people aren't talking, like if everybody kind of gets quiet, and my response to that is to not shut up. So people just think I'm super friendly, but I'm really sometimes very nervous and I'm just chatting away like a crazy person because, because I, I am actually feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, so, so I think it's really normal to, to talk to students about you're going to feel anxiety, this is going to happen. But for some people, it may be more intense in that situation. Just, you know, it, it may actually be, you know, something that they, they're going to have to speak with a counselor or a professional about to help, help them through that. I know he's going to tell me I'm done. But one last thing I will say <laughs> is that I worked as, I worked as a coach. See, I know when the time's up. I worked, as a, um, I worked as an executive coach for a lot of years when I was doing consulting. And um, what was so interesting to me was that the, the, the CEOs that I would work with were people who often were afraid of public speaking when they were young. They avoided it up to a point in their career where now they had to do it. And what I taught them was the exact same thing I taught the freshmen. It was no different. It was just basic things, learning what their anxiety was and, and, and working through it. So helping our students now is going to help perpetuate their careers later. And it's also really going to help them um, once they get into those, those higher level positions. And just keep reminding them, as you said, the more you practice, it, the more comfortable you will become, but the day you stop having an adrenaline rush when you get up to speak is a day your speech is going to be terrible because without it, it's just going to fall flat. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Can I, can I apply that to civil meetings? Will that work? <laughs>